Okay. Um, two things real quick. Next, uh, next Saturday, I know it's already been in the bulletin, is the uh, church picnic, and I'm sure that you are wondering if I have any comments on this. <laughs> huh? Brian had something to say. Well, how many of you have never been to one of the picnics before? Okay, if you're planning on attending, let me apologize in advance for the, uh, the people that will be involved in the chili cook-off. Are you going to be in this one, Danny? No? All right. It becomes... Oh, yeah, see, the, the two people that make the biggest deal out of it aren't going to be in it, cowards. You called my... <laughs> you called my... My... Uh, Barbara Quitter for not shaving my head like yours, so I'll just call you guys what you are. You're not going to get into it, but it's probably better because, you know, we want to try to keep the whole Christian brotherly love kind of thing, and you guys really quench that when you start getting all nasty and competitive, but they have a chili cook-off, and there is prizes that are, there are prizes that are handed out. Well, don't let that keep you from being there. It's, uh, it's always a great time, all kidding aside. These are really cool. I, these have been going on as long as, as we've been coming to the church. When we first started coming here, they were doing the uh, picnics. And it really is a good time for the people to be able to get together that, that are part of this fellowship and, uh, and interact. So we hope that you're able to make it there. And uh, so next Saturday over at the park right across from Kennedy. And uh, I think they're doing, they're doing a pie thing, right? A, a, so if it's not chili, what happens if somebody decides to bring a chili pie? What's going to happen with that? Is that a possibility, Renee? What time should we get there? 10 to 3. Does it say that on here? 10 to 3. So anytime, you know, 10 around, around 10 o'clock would be great. And uh, actually, if you stick around long enough, you'll get a chance to see um, uh, Bob uh, be soaking wet because the kids will always focus on him and uh, he gets destroyed with water balloons and all kinds of things. Kind of fun to watch. Actually, they, they don't get around me much anymore because I always, I always run for the hose. So if they're going to come towards me, they're going to get the business end of a hose and usually that keeps me pretty much safe. And then I look for the people who hate to be, uh, that hate to get wet and I sit next to them. So, all right. John chapter 7, let's, let's turn there. And, there, you know, there is one other thing. I, I kind of debated whether I, I should uh, even bring it up, but uh, you may have noticed a, a couple of signs. You may have even noticed around here, uh, we have security cameras that are around here now, and you may wonder why that is. And um, mainly it's because uh, it's the days in which we live, and we have children around here all the time. You're probably reading, you know, stories constantly of all kinds of things that happen and it is mainly a matter of security for not only the kids that are here during the week because we have a school that operates here, but then we're here Wednesdays and Sundays with kids in children's ministry and then this, this lets us know who comes and goes. And so they're all over the building. They're for the outside and the inside of it just so that we keep an eye. We know what's happening around here and uh, it just tells us a little bit more about the days in which we live. And honestly, there are people who are looking to, um, uh, you may read these too, but there are people that bring lawsuits against churches that are, that are frivolous. And if there's no way to prove that what they're saying happened didn't actually happen, then you're beholden to it. So it's as much for the protection of the kids and really is the ministry as well. So um, that's kind of why you'll notice there's little labels on windows around here and you might look up and see cameras. It's uh, pretty sad that it's come to that, but we try to also safeguard ourselves and, uh, and for the sake of the ministry too. So just thought I'd throw that in and let you kind of know what's happening around here in case you're wondering uh, why it, it just, I, to me they're ugly, but necessary. Chapter 7, Gospel of John. We're going to, uh, to handle the first 13 verses this morning. And uh, what we're going to notice as we look through the text this morning, it's going to probably, if you're careful about it and you've been here for, for uh, all of the studies in this, this will now be the third time that Jesus has gone to Jerusalem or will be going to Jerusalem. And the reason why he does it, very simply put, is uh, there are these main feasts that they're supposed to go to and they're there are people who will be going, and just like all the other feasts, and yet his reasons for being there are completely different, which we'll take a look at. But once again, we have an interesting little detail that right after chapter 6 and the events, which we'll look at really quickly, 
it helps us to realize the incredibly deep division that there is between the believers and the unbelievers. We think of it in our terms today, you know, what it's like in our world. But back then, it was the exact same thing. And it's a little subtle, but still nonetheless very, very important. And it shows us kind of the progression, if you will, of what it was like in this, the area of Galilee where Jesus was at that time. And even then, up close and personal, people were still so divided on who he was. So uh, chapter 7, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you once again for your faithfulness to us and for uh, giving us the ability to be here, to hear your word, to know that uh, the things that, that were uh, challenging people back then are still challenging people today. What do we make of this person, Jesus? And so we ask that you would help us by looking at your word and through your Holy Spirit. Make your word known to us as we apply these things, as we understand them historically, but forward them 2,000 years to our times. And what do they mean today? And we see the same divisions. God, help us to grasp what your word means as we study it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What we're going to notice in the last... Uh, two uh, uh, times of this, chapter 2, Jesus went up at Passover. And that was when he had turned over the, uh, the, the tables and you're, you've made the Lord's house, from taking it from a house of prayer, you, prayer, rather, you've made it into a place of merchandise. And so he turned over the tables. By chapter 5, he comes back at one of the other feast days. And there is debate, was he back there for the same one that he's coming to in chapter 7? Was it for Passover? Was it, was it for Pentecost? Which one was it of the major feasts? And it's unclear, but there are opinions. It doesn't matter. The fact that he was there is why it matters. He was at the Pool of Bethesda, and he healed the man who was there, if you remember that. And then what ended up happening as we study on in the chapter was that he was talking about all judgment comes to him, and that the Father has given him that ability. He claims oneness with the Father. He talks about him not only being the Son of Man, but also the Son of God. And so what happens at the beginning of the chapter has incredible relevance towards the end of the chapter. So why he went up to the feast is completely secondary because we know that as we read on in the chapter, what ends up coming of it is the big issue. So by the time that we get around to chapter 7 in the latter parts, we're going to notice that he is saying things about, uh, about water and, and, uh, and living water, those kinds of, of things that he's saying. And it seems as though from most, most accounts, we believe he said these things on what we call the southern steps. And I'll put a picture of it up here when we get to those texts, uh, because you can visit them. And in fact, we do when we're in Israel. We're, we're standing on the southern steps, more than likely where he makes his public address. But in the run-up to it, what we have here in front of us, this text, we have the, the things that were happening in Galilee, up in the north, and why it was that he wasn't spending all of his time in Jerusalem. That time had not yet come. So in, at the end of uh, last chapter what we looked at last week. Look at verse 66 with me and notice that it says, Now from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. So the ones that remained are going to be even spoken about here in our text today. And the one thing that we know from this is the, the people that would claim to believe in Jesus when the time comes where they have to really come to grips with what it, it is that they believe, some struggle with it. And as we see here, because of the things that Jesus had said, if people will take them at face value and not try to explain them away, but be serious about them, some people are going to come to a place of crisis. And these ones did here. Well, notice in verse 67 that Jesus said to the twelve, to his inner circle, do you also want to believe? And it was Simon Peter who answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And if ever there was a contrast between two groups of people, even those who profess to believe in him, forget about the unbelieving world, but even within the house of what we would consider faith, people that were his disciples, when they really came to grips with what he was saying and the requirements of it, some wanted nothing to do with it and ended up leaving. Others who said, there's no place for us to go aside from you. You've proven to us who you are, though we may not fully understand all things. We have no options here. Now, in an earthly sense, that, that, is just, that seems so hopeless. As a believer, I say, if I don't understand all the bits and pieces, eventually I will, but I have nowhere else to go. And what the world sees as hopeless, 
For the believer, it's hopeful in that I may not understand all things, but I certainly understand the one who speaks. And he knows all things, and it'll all be revealed eventually, so I have no fear. I follow. Well, chapter 7 tells us after these things, verse 1. After these things. So it doesn't give us an amount of time, but it seems shortly thereafter. And let's read our whole text. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. There would be always constant animus there. So the time had not yet come. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea and your disciples, that they also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. And then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time always is ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not yet going to this feast, for my time has not yet come, not yet fully come. So when he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up, he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. And so the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said that he is good, others said no to the contrary, he is a deceiver. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. So what we have here are two separate things. There's what happens at Galilee, and there are the things that happen at Jerusalem. And so as we consider these two things, one really does kind of help lead to the other. Now, there is controversy in this because, again, this is one of those contested passages that you may or may not know. Maybe even by reading it, you think, hey, wait a minute. Well, let's read through the first few verses. It tells us after these things, he uh, did not want to walk in Judea, and he knew that because it was the, the Jews that were seeking to kill him. But this was the Feast of Tabernacles. And so it was for them to go back, and the Tabernacles was the reminder of how God had sustained them through the time of the wilderness. And so at this place, they would build for, them, for themselves what you would consider as booths. And it would be a reminder to them of how God had led them through the wilderness and sustained them for all of those years. And so every year, they would remember this. Well, it says that his brothers, therefore, said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. And if you do these things, show yourself to the world. Well, this shows... Have other children, and what they'll usually say is, whenever you read brothers in the in the text, it means brothers in the spiritual sense, believers, fellow believers. Well, right here you see a, a big distinction here, because right right here in verse uh, eleven it says, "His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go to Judea, that your disciples may see." So his disciples are clearly defined separately from these people that are referred to as brothers. But as you read on a little bit further, look at it, it says in verse 5, for even his brothers did not believe in him. So if they're his brothers, you would figure if it was in the spiritual sense, they would have believed in him. It shows pretty clearly that he had siblings. There's really not a lot of ways to look around this. That's secondary. The bigger deal was that they had fallen into the same belief that somehow the reason why he was here was to promote something or to try to exalt himself. And of course, he wasn't here to do that. He was here very simply to give his life on a cross and to make the promise of eternal life, to have people understand what he offered to them in a spiritual sense. And it was going to take some time for him to do that, about three years plus. Well, he would still make his treks from where he lived down into Jerusalem, and there would be things that would take place, things that he would say. Everything was deliberate. Now, here's one of the other things that we need to understand. When you see the thought that goes into this, why Jesus does things the way that he does, 
He has already told us in other places that what he does, he does because it is the Father who gives him direction. And it was one of the things that when he became flesh and blood, he did come to be part of this temporal uh, existence. And so there were things that he had left behind, if you will. He was still perfectly God, perfectly man, but he had submitted himself to the will of the Father. And it sure does appear in various places that there were things that he didn't know here that he waited for direction from the Father. And this seems to be one of those. But before we move on, I think about these brothers. Now, they would have understood him because they would have grown up with him. Can you imagine growing up with a sibling who never did anything wrong? Never sinned, never did anything when parents weren't watching, never anything conniving about him, never anything that was dishonest or any of those kind of things. And they'd watched him do that. Now they're seeing him do miraculous things and still their eyes are shut to him. They still don't see. It's an amazing thing because what we see with our eyes and what we hear must be mixed with faith. That's what the scripture teaches us. And so that tells us very differently. Look, his disciples versus his brothers, they saw the same things. In fact, his brothers probably saw more. They had to have because they grew up with him. And yet there is still this division. Amazing when you stop to think about it. Well, his brothers didn't believe. That's really what helps us to understand why they said what they said. Verse 6 tells us, Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. This is his way of saying, it's not time for me to do the things that, that I'm supposed to do. You guys just kind of go with it as you want to. So your time is always present. You go do what you're going to do. He's trying to, again, show that separation that's there. Once again, everything is deliberate. One thing you can always say, God never wakes up one day and says, well, let's just go ahead and see what happens. You know, let's wing it and then we'll see how it all works out. God never does anything like that. It is always so carefully thought through. And it's known before they ever even, you know, when God's doing that, before he ever even acts, it's already known. Well, in this case, he says this. Again, this contrasting part. The world cannot hate you, but it does hate me. Now, why is that? Well, because I testify of it that its works are evil. Now, he has said this in other places, but he says it incredibly direct when he has his little back and forth with Nicodemus. I want to take a look there real quick. It's in chapter 3, and it's at verse 18. Actually, we'll look at verse 17. Now, this is, of course, right on the heels of, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes will not perish but have eternal life. We all know the passage. Verse 17 is what tells us, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So that tells us the mission, if you will, of Jesus. That God had such love for humanity that he gave the one thing that could save humanity, that being his Son, that whoever would believe. And then we see that in verse 17, he was sent here not in a way to condemn the world, but that it could be saved. Because in verse 18 it says, and he who believes in him is not condemned. So, of course, we think about the disciples and the brothers that are there in chapter 7. Well, he says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So it's not just believing in the historical sense. It's believing in the way of faith. And that's the difference between the brothers. Remember the ones that said, hey, go show yourself. You know, you're here to promote yourself. Don't try to do everything in secret. Well, they knew who he was. They'd spent their whole lives knowing who he was, but they didn't believe in him. So there's a difference between believing in the physical person historically as opposed to having faith in who that person is and then everything that he taught. Well, look at verse 19. So here is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. If ever you want to know in a very easy way to understand the difference between the believers and the unbelievers, it is, it's very simply this. Those who believe in him come to him based upon what he has said by faith, whether they understand all of it, and they have escaped the judgment that really has come upon all mankind. Now, people have a problem understanding that. They have a problem believing it because it's, it's so foreign to our sensibilities. But we've got to stop projecting ourselves onto God. He makes himself abundantly clear. And it's why he's able to say to his brothers, Look, my time hasn't yet come. It's not time for me to go, but yours is always. Just do what you're going to do. 
It's already somewhat adversarial between them. And so he says, look, you guys are free to go up. The world doesn't hate you. You're going to see the effect that happens as soon as Jesus shows up in Jerusalem. His brothers don't get interrogated. His brothers don't have people that are muttering under their breath about him, and, or about them rather, but they do that about Jesus. And it shows once again there's such a contrast. Well, verse 8 says, So you go up to the feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. And when he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. Now we know immediately after this, he goes up. So did he lie to them? Was he being misleading? Well, of course, any of those kind of things would be sinful. So, of course, we, we look for another alternative that it could possibly mean, because it's not going to be contradictory. The point is, you guys want to go with all the fanfare. You make it a big deal. You visit from place to place. You announce yourself. It's all the big caravan of people. Here it tells us that Jesus went, in verse 10, he went there secretly. He wasn't there to promote himself. I'll go to the feast. We all know, if, if we know anything about the text, whether we've read through it or not, I think just from what John has told us, when Jesus gets around Jerusalem or around a large group of people, he uses it as an opportunity to say something to them. So he may have gone there secretly, but everything is going to be revealed when he gets there. And it's a repeating pattern. We see it at the feast in chapter 2, the feast in chapter 5. It happened in those occasions where he made himself known to the people that were there. So his brothers go up. They go up in the normal way, and there's all the fanfare and the, the noise and all the stuff, and they go up, and it's a very public thing. Here he does what he does secretly. Look again, verse 10. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. Now, once he gets to Jerusalem, it is the same thing that happens consistently when he gets there. Verse 11 says, Now the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? We see the brothers, maybe. We maybe recognize some of those guys. But we certainly know that all of those people from the various places, we know that they're here. We assume that Jesus is as well, and they start to look for him. Well, why? Well, we know why. They're always looking for a way to trip him up. They know the things that he has done the last couple of times that he was there, and he's a troublemaker, right? Picture's probably up in the post office. Wait, when you see him come from Galilee, everybody be looking. Here he comes. And so they're waiting for the problems to come. Well, it says this in verse 12. And there was much complaining. That word could be debate. People are just wondering. They're kind of speaking under their breath. Now, they're not doing it in a public way. It's not on, you know, it's not on some talk show and there's the two sides discussing the whole thing. It's actually kind of quiet. Look at what it says. There, were much, there was much complaining or much debate among the people. Now, this debate and this complaining is, again, that stuff that's under the breath. You're kind of whispering to one another. You don't want to be overheard. There's a fear of what happens if the wrong people hear us talking about him, especially if it seems as though we're somehow sympathetic to him. So there's all this little banter that's going back under their breaths. And here's what some said. Some said he is good, and others said no, to the contrary, he deceives the people. So this, these are broad terms. The deception is that he's trying to lead people away. But there have been a whole variety of those guys. That's happened over and over again. In fact, it gets kind of addressed in the book of Acts. As we close this morning, I'll take you to it. That idea of the debate. And how would we even answer those ones who would say, hey, he's a deceiver. The other people are saying, well, no, he does good things. I mean, just haven't you read the newspapers? He just fed a whole... You know, thousands of people up in Galilee, and he heals the sick and, and the, the lame and the blind, and he does all this really wonderful stuff, and so he's a good guy. They think more in a political sense. Really, under, under this set here, there are very few people like Peter who would be able to say, you're the Christ, you're the Son of the living God. We may not get it all right now. We may not fully understand it, but we do know these things. Now, before Peter left this earth, he fully understood because he was able to see Jesus not only arrested, he saw him interrogated, beaten, put on a cross and died, rose again and then ascended right before his eyes, and then, as Jesus promised, he sent the Holy Spirit to them. So after that, after that time, he obviously knew who it was. So much more was known to him. But I really appreciate this Simon Peter of chapter 6, who was able to say, I don't know everything, but what I do know has me convinced that though I may still have to wait for things, I have nowhere else to go. That is one of the best 
Honestly, it's one of the best places in all of Scripture for us to understand that as Christians, we don't know everything. There are some things that we can't really, even with these minds, we can't grasp. However, we have more than, than an adequate amount of, of information and knowledge that we can bring to bear to make a, a, an informed decision and, and come to follow him. Faith. Well, as it goes on, it says that this is what the people had said. However, look at verse 13. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. This would be the religious leadership. We don't want to take a stand. Now, it's an interesting thing because their time versus ours is remarkably different. Their time and uh, the time of uh, uh, when it was you know, here 2,000 years ago, there were two layers, if you will, of, of bureaucracy, of, of government, if you will. There was the, the theocratic side of it. If you're part of this Jewish nation, then you had to answer to the religious leaders. However, it was run by Rome. And so there were a lot of people kind of measuring their words and worried about what they should say. And so here in verse 13, those opinions were not expressed very openly. I find that interesting in our world today. In fact, I was just having a discussion with some people over the last few days about what do churches and what can pastors actually weigh in on when it comes to matters in the political sense. I know that you guys, I know I mention it this way usually, you may very well not realize it, but there's a, an election coming up in November. So, you know, most people aren't even aware of that. So, uh, just in case you weren't, yeah, we're doing that. And we're told churches have to be silent on this stuff because the government tells you that you can't get involved in politics, which is not true. The church is supposed to be able to say, look, most of the stuff that we hear being debated by the candidates, the Bible has something to say about those things. And so the church has an opinion about it, or should, if God has an opinion about it. The sad part is that so often the church doesn't even agree with God. God's people disagree with God. Isn't that a sickening thing? Well, God has an opinion about all of the moral and the, the social issues. Yeah, he does. So when we get a little closer to the election, we'll probably bring some of that stuff up. But again, you know, long time till November, but just know this. The church is able to take a stand on all of those matters without endorsing a candidate. That's where I would get in trouble. If I had said, we, Calvary Chapel, support fill in the blank, then the powers that be, if they wanted to come after us, could potentially come after us. But let's just face it. There is a fear that is instilled by man. It was happening to them. It is happening to us today. Even the people who want to speak openly about Jesus, you can talk about them until it becomes confrontational. The idea that the church can embrace so many things that are antithetical to the Bible, it's been going on from the very beginning. So the idea is that the church should always find itself in agreement with the Lord and with his word. Simple. However, like it is here, people had opinions, didn't want to express them outwardly because there was a fear of man. I'm telling you that we as a church should be able to say, if this is the Lord's opinion on something based upon his word and we know it, then we shouldn't be ashamed to say it. We should be willing to go ahead and say what needs to be said. These people here had come to a place where they may have had their opinions, but they backed away from it. And there is also the matter of faith that we see in the first part of this chapter, where all the people have the same exact information and reach vastly different conclusions. Once again, this is where a church should be vocal about such things. So when Jesus becomes the topic, how do we discuss him? How is it that we present him to the world? Do we try to make him the one who doesn't really have a lot of opinions, especially if it may offend the world? Or do we say, wait a minute, he's so far above all such things, we take him at face value in the words that he says, and we live accordingly. We don't live in rebellion. Well, there's a good way of looking at this from that same guy the Apostle Peter, right? We just read about him in chapter 6, and we know what he had to say. Where else are we going to go? Look at chapter 5 of the book of Acts with me. Let's turn there. Acts chapter 5. And you will notice here, as we look at these texts, or at the text, I should say, you'll see that there has been a difference in this man. Something has happened that has changed him on a most basic level. 
And that very simply is that he has seen all the things from chapter 6 until now. I've already counted them again, but let me say them one more time. That Jesus has done all that he has done, said all that he has said. He has gone to the cross, which he told them he was going to do. Remember their last little walk up to uh, Jerusalem. I am going and I will be uh, betrayed. The chief priest will hand me to the Gentiles. I will be put to death but raised on the third day. He's already told them all of that by the time that Peter has seen this, but then he watched it. it. Happened just like he said. Jesus was arrested, put to death, and resurrected from the dead, ascended, sent the Spirit. That's why Peter's a different man with so much more assurance and information, because look at what he does. In fact, let me just summarize a little bit of it from verse 17. It starts there. Of course, the, uh, the guys are around the temple, and they're, they're preaching Jesus, and they're talking about the forgiveness of sin. They're talking about all the things that they're supposed to. And now this is the second time that they are brought before the people that are actually thrown in prison. Well, this one has a little twist. They're thrown in prison. While they're there overnight, the doors are open and an angel lets them out and says, go back into the temple and start preaching again. Morning comes. The, uh, the guys want to come. The, the leadership wants to interrogate them. So they send for the prison and the doors are there. The guards are there. They open the doors, but no one's home. And so, of course, they start saying, what's happened? And they find out that these guys that had just broken out from prison didn't go far. They went right back to the temple. So they're doing what God had asked them to do. If I was thrown in jail and got sprung out in the middle of the night, I'm thinking I'd run as far away as I can from Jerusalem. And yet these guys go right back because they're obedient. Now, they're brought back again. They're not treated violently because the people are starting to gravitate towards the message. So they're taken without incident, verse 27. So when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name or in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and you intend to bring this man's blood on us. Now, here's what's really kind of funny. Peter would be able to say, Oh, really? You, want, you, you guys have already put him to death. What do you mean, bring his blood on your hands? You already got it all over your hands. We're not even mentioning that. We're just talking about because everything happened as it did, now we're telling about what happens from this point on. It's the good news. Well, look at verse 29. And I, I sincerely hope, look, their world is so different from ours. Just look at what Peter is saying, and this wouldn't get any of us thrown in prison, not at least in, in the United States. In some places... It would get you put to death. Here's what Peter says. Peter and the other apostles answered and they said, Well, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. For God has exalted him to his right hand to be the prince and the savior and to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. What a difference, huh? A little bit of information changes the message immensely. Let's, as we've read that, let's go back one more time, back to John chapter 7, and let's use that as a contrast. Think about everything that Peter just said. You guys are telling us to do one thing. How can we disobey God? The one that you're worried about, about being blamed for him being put to death, you're already to blame for that, and everyone knows it. And oh, by the way, let's deal with what we know of him. The one that you put to death has resurrected from the dead, and there's forgiveness of sin. There is all that that, that God gives. They've made up their mind. They know what it is that they believe. Now, there are the unbelievers, the interrogators, the ones who are put off by what they're saying. But look at the transition from what we see in John chapter 7. Peter has the things that he says in chapter 6. It leads to it after these things that there were the, the departing of many of the disciples. And there were still some that were left. And I believe somewhat purified by this time. Because let's face it, persecution and, and the idea of, if you will, the, the weak ones leaving because they don't really believe. What remains is pure. Those people are the ones who are following him wherever he leads, no matter what it is that he says. And then they await the time that God reveals all things to him. But then there are the people who know him. They know about him. They think that they know him, but they're the unbelievers. And here then, again, as we look at the, the last verses, 
by the time that he gets to Jerusalem, there is still the division that's there. There are the people who have their opinions. Nobody wants to speak openly because of fear of what may happen. But look at the difference that you see in Acts chapter 5. When you're convinced there is nothing that you have to fear that you say, because the world can only do so much, the one that you look to for the approval, if you will, of what it is that we say and whether or not it's pleasing is God himself. We can only testify of that which we know. Now, back to Acts chapter 5 very quickly, and we'll, we'll conclude here. It's what he says, or it's what sa is said there afterward. Because remember, there were those who had that view that he is this, or others that said he is that. And so all this differing of opinion. Verse 33 tells us, now, when they heard this, they were furious and they plotted to kill them. Isn't that hilarious? If you don't like the message, kill the messenger. Well, here they're, that's what they're trying to do. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in, and respected by the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And then he said to them, men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Thaddeus rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain. And all, of that who, all who obeyed him were scattered and they came to nothing. After this, Judas of Galilee rose up in those days of the census, drew away many people after himself, and also perished, and all those who obeyed were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men, let them alone, for if, the, um, if it is a plan of men, this work uh, will be of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you be found to fight against God." an amazing statement. So isn't this cool? We're 2,000 years after the fact to put that very question to the test. If he's just like those other guys, we don't know who Thaddeus is and we don't know who Judas is. Other than that little mention right there, that's all we know about those guys. History doesn't speak of them at all. But look at how many people are gathered just in this room because of the name of Jesus of Nazareth. God the Son. Amazing. So as we consider these things, look, people have their opinions. It's fine. Opinions are opinions. Whatever. What you come to as your conclusion about who he is matters in an eternal sense. So for all who are hearing what I'm saying this morning, just consider that. The things that he says, they lead to eternal life. They're shown to be true in that we are still talking about them and he's still changing lives 2,000 years after the fact. If you're here this morning and you may know about him in the historical sense, just realize that's not enough. That doesn't help at all because his brothers knew who he was, didn't understand anything about him. They thought he was just there to be some political leader who was, who was trying to show himself. That is not what the scripture teaches. And we're not here because we follow some political leader. Who we follow is a prince and a king. And we await his kingdom when all the stuff of this temporary life is finally put down once and for all. That's what we await. Not waiting for his kingdom in the earthly sense. We're waiting for his kingdom in the eternal sense. Let's stand. As we're dismissed, there'll be people down here to pray with you, to pray for you. The days are getting weirder as we progress on. So, you know, for the believer, we're not to be worried about people's perception of our message. We're supposed to just be faithful to that message. So I encourage you, if you're brothers and sisters, you believers in Jesus, just be bold. Not obnoxious, bold, because you're assured in what it is that you believe. If you're in here this morning and you're more like his brothers, hey, we know who he is. We've seen all the National Geographic shows. We know about him. We know where he comes from. We know him in the historical sense. Just remember, simple acknowledgement of him as a historical figure means nothing. His brothers had that, and we know by what John tells us that they were unbelievers. It goes from the place of believing that he is just some historical figure to the one who has the words of eternal life.
we thank you for your word. We're so grateful for how you speak to us through the generations, through the, the years. And what was said back then that had such relevance to them has so much relevance to us. In fact, in a world that's looking for relevance, we can look at a book that has accounts from thousands of years back and they mean as much to us today as they did, as they did then. We would ask, Lord, that you would help us to take what we hear and see and mix it with faith, as your word says, that we would come to a full understanding of what we should do in, these, in this world, in these days. God, that we would be those who are willing to speak truth and uh, not be concerned about people's opinion, just yours. So we thank you. We give you praise. We give you honor and all glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.